the last thing the CEO had said, okay, gentlemen, keep a good lookout behind. Mm -hmm. And who would ever think that somebody would be there at that specific time uh, when I was next, I was next. Yeah. And it would have been that quick. Absolutely. Uh, but uh, it was an attitude, too. I always did keep a good lookout. Every once in a while I'd say, okay, Paul, look back. But you had none of this cruising and cruising and cruising, except the one time I did cruise through. I happened to go right over brussels Iver, which is their airport, and uh, I dropped two 500-pound bombs on the nice runway. <laughs> 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 but... Uh, those things didn't do a lot of damage. And the other thing I used to do, which the Sammy Horror uh, reproved me about, was sometimes get so frustrated at not seeing an enemy airplane to shoot a, I'd shoot up the runway with cannon and machine guns. <laughs> he says, I see you've been, when your group captain horse says, I see you've been front gunning uh, enemy aerodromes. I said, well, yeah, I get so frustrated not being able to find any airplanes to shoot at. I said, well, you know, don't do that. It's a waste of ammunition. Yeah. It doesn't do any good. I said, okay, sir. So, but that, that was it. So you did your OTU, you met up with Paul, uh -huh. and then you uh, were posted to a squad. What squad was it again? Okay. We didn't know. Okay. At the end of the course, squadron leader Russell, who was a CFI, came and said, well, gentlemen, uh, congratulations on completing the course. Uh, you're now ready for posting for your next step. But uh, I've had a, an urgent request for uh, volunteers to go to the Middle East to a squadron out there. They didn't say what squadron, to mm -hmm. a squadron out there. And uh, if anybody here would like to volunteer, so my, Paul and I, hands went right up. So we were, well, five or six of us did. So... Uh, that meant it doubled my mosquito time because mm -hmm. I had 75 hours, I think, by the time I had messed around with okay. the O2 and stuff. And then uh, by doing three or four trips to the Middle East, uh, 1,201 miles to Gibraltar, 1,200 miles to Gibraltar, 1,201 miles to uh, Rabbit Sally, which is just like over here, mm -hmm. um, it gave me a lot more not just mosquito flying, but air experience flying. Mm -hmm. And flying over night in England was good because of, of the blackouts and stuff. And coming into land and coming back uh, from flying, uh, we'd, we would call large type, which on the code said large type, this is Cricket 3-4. I was... We were 23 squadron or Cricket Air Force. That was Cricket 3-4. Cricket 3-4 or uh, 10 minutes away, 60 miles out or something. And he said, uh, Roger, 3-4, we've got you. Just call when you're drying your feet when you're crossing the coast. So it said, large type, 3-4, uh, uh, we're, we're drying our feet. He said, we're heading for uh, the squadron, you know. Uh, so he said, okay, and I go over to the squadron frequency and say that uh, uh, we're over, we get called when we're overhead, said that, and they say, okay, uh, land on runway such and such and so forth. So uh, it was pretty well cut and dried, but there was a great comfort first in getting off the water. Mm -hmm. I heard about one guy, a Spitfire pilot, whose friend was shot down in the North Sea. Uh, his friend went down and finished the job because he would have died of his exposure. So he just put the nose in and... No, he just shot him with the machine guns. Yeah. Oh, yeah. no. Yeah. Oh, jeez. Uh, and I, I was... I was... Over the water, going over, where the hell, I forget where we're going, either going or coming, I said, I never again, hello, any aircraft, where the hell are we? Hmm. And I said, well, I don't know where you are, but I'm 40 miles 
northwest of the Frisian Islands. And I would suggest uh, uh, that you steer probably 290 or 300 degrees to get to, in, to, get to Great Britain. Oh, thanks, buddy. <laughs> Can you imagine that? <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. So you, you volunteered to go down to the Middle East. Yeah. And you had, you would have, so you would have taken off out of England. Could the mosquito do 1,200 miles in one hop? Oh, God, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. And uh, so you would have, I, guess, I assume you would have flown at night, and you would have flown over occupied France to get down there. Oh, we didn't. Oh, you did We didn't? didn't go over enemy territory. Oh, okay, okay. But we were within reach of the Falkland 190s, who could come out and get us off the shore of uh, Portugal and Spain. Oh, okay, okay. So we went from uh, Portreath to Land's End, then, then we head down to Lake Cape St. Vincent and Cape Finisterre, whichever comes first, uh, at the, the top, you know, of the Bay of Biscay. Mm -hmm. And we were about 10 miles out to sea and flying at 10,000 feet. And then uh, we got to Cape St. Vincent and turn in and to, to land at Gibraltar, it had to be procedural. You can't just go in and land. What you have to do is you've got to come in at 1,000 feet, I think it was, with your nav lights on and your undercarriage down and identify. They'd give you a red or a green light to go left or right, to go around the rock and land this way or that way. Okay. And um, if you didn't, it shoot you. Shoot you down. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we're pretty careful about that, naturally. But you, they, those sorts of things. Uh, Prince Philip, nephew of Lord Mountbatten, was in a destroyer or something, passing. They were going up the Irish Sea, and uh, he was passing the this big ship, and he was doing the Royal Yacht Britannia past this big uh, warship, and Mount, he knew it was his uncle there, and. Uh, he signaled, good, <laughs> he waved, and go, went into Liverpool and passed him and just barely kissed the, the, the pier, you know, oh, oops. and gone. <laughs> That's not cool. Oh, God. But anyway, uh, we had such wonderful, wonderful experience to, to be over there. And particularly when I was of the minority, I was the only Canadian pilot on 23 Squadron for a good part of the time that I was mm -hmm. there. And we had every country. We had Poland, the Netherlands, South Africa, New Zealand, Australian, American. Oh, yeah. you know, uh, it, was just, it was just a marvelous mix to be rubbing shoulders with all of them. You felt like in Canada, it would be just sort of, I didn't really feel like that, but it would just be sort of another course. I didn't know what course came next, you know, I'm pretty mm -hmm. naive. But I knew if I studied long and hard that I could probably make it, but I wasn't that positive because I didn't know whether I could fly. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, it, uh, it all worked out in the end. And yeah. uh, I, was, I came really quite high in the the marks mm -hmm. of the different courses that mm -hmm. uh, we were just taking. hard work I'm yeah but it was a work of uh really adoration of flying oh. that airplane uh, it was just any airplane mm -hmm. but to fly like uh, the blenheim which was left over from the battle of britain uh, and they had some wonderful pictures in flight in the airplane of these of these aircraft and everything, and about read about Billy Bishop, Johnny Johnson. Uh, it was just. Did totally... you ever meet Johnny Johnson? Hmm? Did you ever meet Johnny Johnson? Never did. Oh, no. Okay. But uh, I, I did. Well, no, we met Billy Bishop mm -hmm. because when we were at Manning Depot, he came and addressed the audience of mm -hmm. uh, the new intake and uh, so I I should pause for a second because we have some people that actually are Canadian oh yeah so we're, we're speaking from a very Canadian centric uh, perspective here but uh, 
For those of you who don't, aren't familiar with a word named Billy Bishop, uh, if you look up uh, top aces of World War I, he's number two. No, number three overall, number two for the Allies. Yeah. Top British or Commonwealth ace. Cause, and he was born not far from here, actually, about a three-hour drive far from here. That's in right. In Rowan Ontario. Yeah. So he's, he's a Canadian legend, uh, but yeah, some people probably aren't familiar with that, so I felt that we should explain it. But also, we learned about the enemy, Baron von Richthofen. Yeah, the Red Baron. Who yeah. flew the Red Baron, and uh, they were brave guys. Oh, yeah. Very brave on both sides. And what they're doing is they're defending their homeland like we would. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we marry interracially. We marry like uh, girls of German extraction and that sort of thing. Some guys get over there and they get married, get, fall in love and get married to somebody over there and bring their war brides home. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, the enemy was not the enemy, as you know, as such. The enemy was the Hitlers and mm -hmm. the Mussolini. Yes. They were, but the, the youngsters uh, of any age up to 50 who served for them were protecting their homeland. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we couldn't resent the fact that they were doing that. But the fact that uh, we're pitted against them, we were shot at each other. But uh, it was a terrible thing for people like us to fly over or near a city that was being bombed, like uh, the, any place in the Ruhr, mm -hmm. uh, Berlin, you know, Cologne, all of those places, and we flew over them to do our, our uh, patrolling because we're flying to uh, circle German night fighter aerodromes that were in the area. So, uh, and believe it or not, even at uh, seven, eight or 10,000 feet, the, the terrible, terrible smell of, of the death uh, would, would you'd, you'd, you'd smell basically burning people. Yes. Oh, and it was just uh, terrible, just terrible. And it's hard to believe when everything is so peaceful in Britain. Uh, the only thing they had to worry about was driving at night. And of course, our poor relatives back in Canada, they had sugar and gas rationing. What a terrible thing, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, yeah. But I wasn't afraid that my family was being bombed out exactly. of existence, and like some of my squadron mates. And uh, I did lose good friends. Like the, one of my best friends, after I had an accident on the squadron with a, a tire that blew, he took my flight, uh, my trip, because he was uh, the spare, and he was killed at Guttersloe. And, but uh, they found uh, his remains, and I went over to see his family and the navigator's family, uh, and felt terrible about it, but they were, so very understanding. The navigator's wife uh, was just really sweet about it, and she had a three-year-old daughter. And she said, "Oh, you know, it's just terrible. These things do happen, but this is the war is on, and it's a terrible thing." It's a different attitude. Hmm? It's a different attitude. People yes, well, you know, you wonder how can they do it, and they're driving around in the blackout and uh, mm -hmm. uh, rationing sugar, gasoline. So many things, and we we supported that with our convoys mm -hmm. of goods, food, aircraft, tanks, ammo, armies, navies, air force types, and so forth. So it was a very lucky thing for people like me who, at the time it was started, was only 15 or 16 years of age. Mm -hmm. Uh, because I was still reading about uh, Billy Bishop and mm -hmm. Richthofen and people like that. And actually uh, be over there uh, at a time when heroes of that magnitude were, were doing what they did. Like the dam busters. The other one was the Turpits. Mm -hmm. uh, getting it out of a fjord, and my goodness, and it was, it was disabled by an airplane, it was as much bigger than a tiger moth, which is a swordfish, yeah. a biplane, which you spit through, and it, 
it sent a torpedo after the Bismarck and got its steering mechanism and yeah. it could only circle and it caused it to be sunk. Yeah. And uh, who would ever think that combination would ever work? That mm. miraculously hiding in a fjord, then coming out and getting uh, uh, sunk. Yeah. So uh, it was an amazing experience. Mm -hmm. uh, it was an interruption of our uh, teenage years, but it was a, a tremendous lesson mm -hmm. in life as a whole. Life is precious and it taught us manners. It taught us restraint. When, as passionate young men, we were out there and exposed to all the pleasures that you could possibly imagine. And uh, a lot of them, you know, uh, they took advantage of that and a lot of them were killed and unfortunately it left a lot of young families without uh, a, a father mm -hmm. and it was very sad. My, my good chum uh, Ken Eastwood was lost uh, when somebody had uh, made an improper turn with a mosquito I was flying and it uh, twisted the the tweaked the tire so badly that uh, when I went to land on it, the tire blew, and I managed to get around with it. And the mm -hmm. CEO said, "You got a blown tire." But we had to be so careful that we didn't lock the wheel and turn in one tire. So basically, the pilot before you had locked the wheel, done a tire, and well, that was a it. conventional way to do it. You lock the tire mm -hmm. and you rotate around mm -hmm. the other one. But they were they were lighter airplanes. Like our airplanes, when we flew them out, we were, that was 11 tons. Yeah, yeah. And it's a little airplane, 54 foot, mm -hmm. two inch wingspan. Yeah. And uh, two man crew. Uh, so, and we could take the same, practically the same uh, bomb load as a flying fortress. That's amazing. Who had several men crew, yeah. but they were flying daylight. So the British and the Americans got together, together, and the Americans didn't feel like flying at night, and the Brits were quite happy to fly at night, and as a, that's how they made the choice. So the Americans did the the day flying, and the Falkwolves and one night and one o nines and so forth were after them, and the the jet jobs and everything were after them, and the the losses were appalling. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. it was a wartime, and. Any loss is appalling. Mm -hmm. So, you kind of pick up the story. You were you were down in Gibraltar to yes. go meet your squadron. Well, we landed at Gibraltar first, mm -hmm. and then uh, they said, "Well, we don't know where the squadron is, but uh, you might." They start at start at Rabat near Casablanca. Uh, that was a an hour's trip over there. Not that very far, 45 minutes. And then from there, they said, we don't know, but uh, fly around to Tunis mm -hmm. and see, maybe they'll have some idea. So we got to Tunis. Well, we heard that they were up in Malta, but I'm not too sure where they are. So we flew to Malta. Malta said, well, yes, they were here mm -hmm. for quite some time. And they went to Italy. And, uh, but I think they may have gone beyond that. Somebody said they could be in Sardinia at a place called Alghero. So we flew to Alghero, Sardinia, and there they were. In other words, you, were basically, you toured all around the Mediterranean looking for your squadron. Yes, <laughs> and we got there, and they urgently wanted replacement crews. And the CEO said, well, uh, thank you for coming, uh, but uh, we don't need you now. We're over strength, but uh, we'll keep the aircraft and... Uh, they put us up in a hotel, and I should tell you this because it's kind of pertinent. They had the hot and cold water, you know. Mm -hmm. It was on a Y connection to the same supply. <laughs> it was all cold. It was all cold. <laughs> oh, that was so funny. They shipped us off to Algiers on a, a DC-3, so I went to the air officer commanding, this will take just a moment. Oh, no worries. To the air officer commanding Middle East, with my navigator and said, Sir, uh, we, said my navigator, I and a few other of these crews uh, came down to uh, 
23 Squadron in Sardinia at a request, an urgent request for replacement crews. And we got there and we find that they're over strength. So they kept the airplane and sent us here. They said, well, gentlemen, uh, this is war, you know, and uh, I understand all of that, but uh, I can't force them to take you. But I can and will send you back where you came from. They may have more work for you mm -hmm. to do. I said, well, gosh, could we do it? He said, yes, you can. So he arranged for us to get on a DC-3 and fly to Gibraltar and then up to England. Okay. Another time we flew back, we flew from, from in a Catalina off the water near Casablanca and flew up to Scotland in a Catalina. Oh, wow. And they sent me back, a 99 mile an hour airplane, the climbing, <laughs> diving, or anything, sent me back in the blister to look, look out for enemy airplanes. Oh my God. It took 14 hours oh. to fly up to Scotland from down there. Oh my God. But, oh, and froze to death. I bet. But anyway, uh, what, it, what it did for somebody like me and for my navigator, it brought us up to speed in the variations of situations in wartime. Mm -hmm. We didn't hear the local news. We didn't know where who was going at where or what was happening mm -hmm. where. But we knew at the place we were, were flying what the local situation was. Mm -hmm. So when we got uh, in Sardinia, this will just take a moment to explain, finally settled for the umpteenth time down at Sardinia, we were ready to do our, we did one night flying test, flew our nursery trip around the island of Corsica, which was not an enemy hand, and came in and landed. And uh, I came in, we were ready to the next night to do our first operations over Italy or southern France. Mm -hmm. We did our night flight test, came back and landed and parked the airplane and the ground crew said, well guys, that's it, we're going back to England. <laughs> he said, we're finished here. I said, my goodness, after all this fuss, coming down here several yeah. times, now we're going to go back, we're going back by sea. Oh, lovely. So we went by the uh, Italian cruiser, the Garibaldi, mm -hmm. who, they had stopped fighting us at that time, to Naples, and they went to, on the Strath Neighbor, an, an, an ocean liner, that took us back to uh, um, Liverpool. How long did that take? It seemed uh, like it's three or four days, okay. I think. It was it was like 1,200 miles. You know? Were you were you at a convoy for that one? No. Okay. We're all alone. But they have to go far enough out yeah. to be out of reach. Yeah. Of the, uh, so you did the first trip down to uh, to your squadron because you eventually went, were with twenty three squadron. Yes, yeah. I found out it was twenty three squadron. Okay, so you you flew down, you dropped off the airplane. They well, said we found out it. maybe just before we did that that it was going to be twenty three squadron. So we got down there after about the third time trying, mm. and we got there and accepted. And so you were ferrying, you ferried a few airplanes down. So you did yes, multiple I did. trips Mosquitoes, down. Mosquitoes, yes. You did multiple trips down to... Uh, uh, well, I think we threw three, three or four. I just forget which. No, no, that's, that's fine. But, yeah, they, but so you had multiple times you went yes. down there and eventually they said, okay, you can join but us. But what it did, it doubled my time yeah. on the airplane. Yeah. It gave me experience flying, flying 1,200 miles over water. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it made me far more conversant with the airplane that I love most in the world. So, and I got to be pretty good at flying it. So a, a long range trip like that, how would it work between you and the navigator? Because obviously you're, you're flying, you're, you're, you're maintaining a heading, but he's doing all the nav. So, well, how much nav can you do when you're in the middle of the ocean? No, I, mean, I guess you can do star shots. Uh, well, I mean, no, I mean, he didn't do any. Oh, really? He didn't do any of that, no. Oh, wow. But uh, we look for visuals. Like we go from, uh, Land, we take off from Port Trees, pass the lands end, and turn left and go down to Cape Finisterre, I think was the first one. And we'd see that in the distance, then we'd turn slightly right and go south from there to Cape Finisterre, or whatever mm -hmm. it is. I'm not sure if I got those mixed up. That's okay. On the uh, bottom of Portugal, and turn left to go into um, Gibraltar, mm -hmm. or to go just slightly right to go on to Rabat, which is about a mile difference, doing it from that point. Mm -hmm. So when you got back to England, where were you based? We were based, do you know Norfolk? 
You know the I'm wash? With it, yes. The wash? No, I don't know that. Okay, if you go up the right hand side of England, there's London here, mm. then there's a little cut in the, up halfway up is the wash. Okay. It's in Norfolk, mm -hmm. just near the east coast mm -hmm. between London and the wash. Okay. At a place called Fakenham, mm -hmm. is the main town, the city. Little Snoring was the village close to there, and it was at Little Snoring that okay. we settled down. There were two squadrons, 515 and 23, 23. squadron, 515, yeah. So, what was your first operational sortie then? The first oper operational sortie was a nursery trip. Okay. A nursery trip is, it gets you over enemy territory, and to fly an operational trip, you circle the, the aerodrome, to set course for uh, the place where we would jump off, uh, lowest off or something like that. And uh, at that point, from 5,000 feet, we'd dive down to 500 feet to fly across the English Channel. And this is all at night? Black of night. Wow. And one time I thought I saw another light, it was another mosquito, went up, just about head on, oh climbed over me heading back, wow. coming back that way. And fly across there then, about five minutes before you'd hit the coast, you'd climbed to six or 7,000 feet, ready to dive over the coast, uh, weaving in like that quickly as you would cross the coast in case they came up with any aircraft. Because that's, they had a lot of defenses along the coast, yes. I'm assuming? Okay. So, and then you'd settle down in there and you'd go to the Zyder Z, the sea. We go to like the Willemstad and uh, whatever, and you circle around. We circled around the inside of the Zyder Z, and we could see fishing boats and stuff down there, just to the over enemy territory. Uh, there are enemy aircraft at Leowarden, at Ardorf, Marks, Burrell, Soisterberg and Deal, and Gilsey and Eindhoven, mm -hmm. uh, and so forth. Uh, so you were exposed to enemy action. You could see in the distance, sometimes the searchlight going okay. up and so forth. And that would, we stayed in there for 15 or 20 minutes, I think, and circled around, then we came back home. And so it's busy to wet your teeth. Yes. Yeah. So then we called uh, large type. There's a call sign, they called large type, it's cricket three, four. Uh, uh, we're returning, we're 40 miles northwest, uh, northeast. Uh, so Roger three, four. Uh, Call us when you're drying your feet. So mm -hmm. over there's a large type. We're drying our feet and switching over to uh, a squadron uh, frequency. Uh, thank you, three, four. Uh, good night. Good night, chaps. Mm -hmm. So then we come back to England, get uh, near the base. We say, uh, uh, X King. This is Cricket 3-4, X-King was the base. Mm -hmm. uh, it's Cricket 3-4 identifying, we're uh, uh, 10 minutes away. So we'd get over, it said, Roger, call us when you're over overhead. So we'd go over at about 3,000 feet. And say, so we're overhead, 3,000 feet. Roger, you're clear land on 2-4, and you're number one. And uh, at that point, we would have got to England, turned our nav lights on, mm -hmm. so we'd be visible. And we'd, we'd circle around and, and come in and land. And after land, uh, three, four is down, and uh, you'd say, uh, Cricket three, four, we're, we're down, and uh, going to uh, the our dispersal. Roger, old boy, nice to have you back. Thanks, Cobby. And we'd go and park at our parking place. Careful to not turn on one tire. Yeah, careful. <laughs> not, exactly. But, so that was your first mission. Uh, yeah. How did you feel? I felt sort of wonderful mm -hmm. that we had been over, actually been over enemy territory within range of not only the air, but the ground defenses. Mm -hmm. And that it was that simple. The Zyder Z. Uh, had a lot of airplanes in it, you know, and uh, <coughs> they broke the dams and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so we were prepared for anything. We and I said, okay, Paul, look back, and he's looking back, and used to doing that. Mm -hmm. So and coming back, it I have there's a sense of relief, but uh, also 
wearing us because I said, this is the way traditionally we'll be coming in in the dark. So that's how it started. <laughs>